everyone, welcome to lecture 10 of the course. And in this lecture, we're going to be going over events, operators, and conditions. So it's actually three categories. We did one, then we did two in the last lecture, and now we're doing three. But we're kind of scaling it up so that we can start really fitting these pieces together and really connecting the dots. As you'll see, I'm just going to go new project up here on the top right of the screen and the My Stuff folder. And after that, I'm going to go ahead and name the project. I'm going to name it Events operators and conditions demo or something like that again i'm not super creative with names or following along which i recommend you do go for the name whatever you want and i'll just name it um what should i name it i almost forgot what i had just decided okay so events operators and conditions so you might see events you might see operators and you don't see conditions so you might have two questions here why are we going out of order is maybe one question you have another question you might have is where is conditions well just to help you later in your programming career i'm going to refer to the control category as the conditions category because the control category is primarily conditional statements as you'll see and i'll explain what a conditional statement is you're going to need to know what those are if you want to continue your programming career or if you just want to build up that solid computer programming vocabulary and that's why i'm calling it a little bit different than what scratch normally call it and as far as events and operators go the reason why i'm going out of order here is because sensing and variables i feel like go together pretty well and i don't really want to introduce uh they're kind of heavy enough that i want to introduce them separately and the lecture after that which will be two lectures from now will just be my blocks and then also a function called commenting and then we'll be ready for a bunch of really cool projects to work on so that's kind of a little bit of an outline rough outline for you guys and I'm going to go ahead and go to my events first of all because again events is the first thing we're going to look at and you're going to be using this function a ton and you might notice this is a very different shape than the functions we've previously worked with and I'm going to get to that in just a moment and as you can see these can also have parameters uh, this function has a parameter this function has a parameter and this function has a parameter if you see my mouse pointer and not all of them do though so I'm just going to go ahead and start with when green flag click is how you would read that. So basically something happens whenever I click this green flag. And again, that's how you start the program or at least test it if you're trying to run something. So if I want the cat to move steps or move 10 steps, which really just means move 10 pixels if you remember in the direction it's facing, which is 90 degrees. And the cat is the cat's direction is pretty much the direction he's looking. So I'll move that way should be at about X10, Y0. Then I'll go ahead and go turn 15 degrees after that. I'm going to go back to my events category again. I can just click on it instead of scrolling. I'm going to go ahead and click the green flag and see what happens. And just like that. What if I keep clicking the green flag? It should just keep going in a circle. Just like that. And we're back where we started X or Y0. Very cool. So what about when key space pressed? Well... We can actually duplicate these two functions and just it's the same thing. Let's say drop down parameter so it can be whatever we want. We can go up arrow, down arrow, right arrow, and left arrow. Means the arrow keys. And you can just specify an arrow key. And then any means any key on our keyboard. And then we also have the numbers and letters. So if I just go out and key space press, I'll do that since it's the default, but it'll work just the same. It's just that the input that it wants changes. So I'm going to um, click the space bar. And just like that, notice how it like outlines yellow for a second whenever I click it. I can even hold it too to make it go really fast. Now if I didn't want to do that, I'll, uh, we could change the speed of that and I'll show you how to do that here soon. This is going to be a very value packed information packed lecture. So just keep that in mind and it would be very good to pay attention. So when this sprite clicked is the same thing except for it's a different input that triggers the, uh, the script under it. And... Basically, well, I mean, the whole thing is a script, but it triggers the function and or functions under it. It can be singular or plural because there could be one function or there could be a million functions. But, you know, everything under it will trigger on this input. So essentially, these and not all event functions are like this. As you can see, the broadcast functions are not. But most event functions are an input function that basically starts off a script. And it, yeah, that's pretty much what it is. It just starts off a script. There's not a much more really weird terminology you could describe that with it's just essentially it's just the starting point for a script uh, these these ones that are kind of rounded off at the top and 
if I go ahead and click on our cat then, because when this sprite click, she should uh, move 10 steps and he should turn 15 degrees clockwise, because that's what I want to do when I right click him. If I click outside, it won't do anything, but if I do click on him, then it'll work. Just like that. Very cool. So, if I go ahead and... Now, you're not going to probably find yourself using this one too much, but I'm going to go over it, of course. I'm going to actually um, make some more backdrops just to test this. But basically, whenever the backdrop switches to a certain backdrop, let's say the forest backdrop, you know, whenever backdrop switches to forest, then it would trigger this event. And let's just go ahead and get the backdrops here. And again, I selected my stage so I can edit my backdrops. All name. I'll just leave that to be. I'm going to get a couple from the library here. I'll just do castle. I'll do blue sky. I'm going to go ahead and go to my looks category and grab a switch backdrop function real quick. Maybe a couple. Alright, so I have one function that switches to castle 1. I have one function that switches to blue sky. Again, I'm just changing the drop down parameter. Going back to events here, and let's just test this out. So when backdrop switches to... Okay, well, it's on blue sky right now, but if whenever it switches to castle 1, it should move 10 steps and turn 15 degrees. Let's switch it to castle 1. Just like that. Now, what if we made the same thing for blue sky? So, so this is on castle one. If we were to switch the blue sky, it should trigger this, which should move 10 steps in the direction it's facing and change the direction by 15 degrees clockwise again. Just like that. And now we're basically repeating this whole thing over and over and over. And we're just triggering different scripts by using our two switch backdrop functions because that's the input it's looking for. So now we have five ways that we can make this cat go. And I'm just going to... Set him back to the default position. We'll just say it's 90 degrees and X0, Y0. I'm just going to switch the backdrop uh, back to backdrop 1 so it's easier to see. And let's go back to our code for sprite 1. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And um, let's look at this. So when loudness is greater than 10. We can also do timer, but you're probably not going to be using the built-in timer too much. And I'll explain why. So... This loudness is not referring to volume. This is referring to your mic. So once we get into the sensing category, we'll talk about detecting the mic within your program. So if you talk loud enough, and I assume this uses decibels for quantities, if you're talking louder than 10 decibels, then basically something will happen. So if I were to connect my mic, and my mic were louder than a certain uh, loudness, then it would the function would trigger as well. You're almost never going to use this. If you choose these, the built-in timer, which is also in the sensing category, then whenever the timer is past 10 seconds, for example, then something would happen. And it just uses seconds for this parameter. So, uh, But you're probably going to be wanting to do custom timers, which are usually a little bit more accurate using variables. And we'll make a custom timer here in our project. So don't worry about that. Now, here's a very, 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 very important thing. You're going to be using a ton, which is messages. There's three functions for messages. There's one input function and two regular functions. So, <clears throat> you're almost never going to be using and wait. And pretty much the only difference is, if you remember, if we go to sound, there was play sound until done and start sound. It's just this one. Or maybe that's not the best analogy. So, basically nothing else will happen in the script like let's say this is sandwiched between these two functions it'll wait to turn 15 degrees instead of just immediately turning 15 degrees so if we the difference between broadcast message bro broadcast message and wait I'll, ex I'll actually explain what this even means in a second but i'm just going to demonstrate the difference between and wait and and without the and wait so with the and wait if it's between if it's somewhere within a script basically what it's going to do is is going to go ahead and not turn until this function is completed whereas here it'll just broadcast a message and immediately continue the script so it'll wait a little bit until it's done and without the and wait there will be no delay and you're almost never going to be using the and wait again and so that that's what that does now what does this actually do so what we can do is we can go ahead and make a message i'll just call it test And so we can broadcast this somewhere. Let's say whenever the backdrops. No, no. Let's say, uh, oops. 
we'll get to that add comment thing later. Uh, let's say whenever the um, let's say whenever the A key on our keyboard is pressed, then test will be broadcasted. Now, when test is received, again, a drop down parameter, we can ever either create a new message or choose an existing one, and message one is the default, but it's not going to do anything because there's no code for it yet. We're just going to mess with test, so, uh, so whenever key A is pressed, we're going to broadcast over to test. When test is received, what do we want to happen? Well, we can just say, say, the message has been received. So let's go ahead and press A and test this. Just like that. So the message has been received, which means this was successful. When I press A, test was broadcasted and received and a, by a different script within the same class. So it doesn't have to be within the same class because messages are completely uh, completely public and completely universal and we'll go over public and private later like you know what's public what's private and private basically means pertaining to a class and then public means pertaining to all classes but I will definitely expand on that in a future lecture okay so here is your events category for you and we'll expand on this a lot because we'll be using this a lot in the future but I'm just going to go ahead and Actually, I'm going to delete all of this, and we're just going to go ahead and jump straight into operators. Now, operators do not have a single function. These are all values. In fact, there's a new format of value here that's kind of in, you might be used to the ones that are rounded off. There's also the angular ones, and that basically just means that uh, some, uh, some inputs or some parameters can only pick up this data type where it's, uh, where it's an angular operator. And some can only pick up rounded values. So th these are all values, okay? That's all operators are. And there's just different formats of those values that only some parameters can handle. So some might use the angular ones, and some might use the round ones, and some might even use both. I'll expand on that. So let's just first go with these multiplication, division, addition and subtraction operators. And actually in order, it would be additions to your plus symbol here and subtraction is your hyphen or minus symbol now in programming asterisk always means multiplication and the forward slash and here's a forward slash by the way here let me just zoom in forward slash means division but here's a forward slash I guess I can't type it there because it's only certain data types like um, only numbers can be typed there are only values uh, let's see that would be a forward slash and that would be a backward slash. Forward slash. Backward slash. You're going to want to know that for the for your future your programming career if you choose to continue it. And I'm just going to stop all scripts so that he doesn't keep saying that. And so what does this do? Well, basically, it adds two values together. Well, how can I plug this in? Well, let's say let's just use our say function. I love using this for testing and explaining. So if we go ahead and say, I mean, if we just put two numbers in here and you know one plus two it's just gonna be three but how do we even test this three because we can click this nothing will happen I mean well there will be a little value here just to prove it's three but like nothing will happen in our actual program but if we say it then it should say instead of saying one plus two it should actually say the result because it's passing the result of this operator as a value in the format of a parameter to our function so again we have this operator one plus two it's acting as a value and the function passes that value or uses it as the parameter of the function so that it can print out as output what this value is which is 1 plus 2 and should equal 3 so he should say 3 oops I guess I should yep all right and you know 1 plus 5 is what 6 uh, now what is this number plus this number Uh, I'm not too sure, but we'll let the computer do it for us. And there we go. That's what that equals. So you can actually find some useful things for this. And don't worry, we'll actually make a calculator uh, very soon here. And that'll be that'll be uh, a very interesting thing. We'll learn a lot and work a lot with operators. So that's probably the least exciting project that we're going to work on. But don't worry, because we're going to learn a ton. It's going to save you a lot of time in the future. Subtraction is the same thing. I can go 
a thousand, ten thousand minus one should be nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. And there it is. Uh, there it is. Nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, and it's just like that. Actually, I want to bring back these two for a second just to show you something. Again, we can use any of these values. Let's say we know that our size is a hundred, and we know that our direction is ninety. So if we subtract, actually I'll get rid of this addition. If we subtract our size by our direction, since size is 100 and direction is 90, we should get 10. It should be the resultant value. And if we plug that into our save function, you just should say 10. Well, 10.15. So maybe this is just an estimated or it's been rounded. Here, it's actually, go ahead and actually type it in manually. There we go, now it's 10. So I think whenever I was messing with this right here it actually got cut off at a decimal but it rounded this to 90 so i think that's what happened and sometimes little th things like that will happen you just have to kind of figure out what the problem is um 10 and 50 what's well, 10 times 50 that should be 500 right boom 500 we'll actually do some smaller numbers what's 2 times 4 or 4 times 2 it's the same thing it should be 8 so we should say 8 division uh, what's 4 divided by 2 should be 2, so we should print 2. Okay. And again, we can always test the value by clicking on the operator and then just like that. Now, what if we want to do 4 divided by 3 and it can do decimals just like that? And do 4 divided by negative 6. And we can also do negatives. And we can even do decimals within these parameters. Just like that and it actually does round it quite often uh, whenever you're outputting it but it actually goes to I believe 16 decimal places whenever you're which is basically the amount of numbers after the decimal whenever you're actually testing the operator and once we make our calculator you'll see how this really can come into play for a practical application but right now it's just rounding it uh, as an output in our program but this is actually the value it's getting which is really cool because it's a bit much easier for a computer to do this for you than actually doing it yourself. This one's pretty cool. Uh, this actually adds a kind of idea of randomness and probability to your project. So you can pick random numbers and the range is between these two parameters. So if we go between 1 and 10, well, it's just going to be a random number between 1 and 10. So you're just going to print random numbers between 1 and 10. Or we can go, again, we can go direction, which is 90, and size, which is 100. And it should be random numbers between 90 and 100 now. Just like that. Or whatever we choose to input. And the cool thing about this is that you can, although it's only a whole number, so there's no decimals, you can do some very, very cool things. We can go actually plus, if you want to make it even more random, we can go a random number between 1 and 10 plus a random number between 1 and 10. And then there's even more randomness in the number that's going to be generated. So it's actually between 2 and 20. Yeah, this would be random numbers between 2 and 20. Just cool things like that. Oh, if we wanted to uh, roll a dice... Yeah, if we wanted to roll a die, I guess is the singular form of dice. We could go random 1 to 6. And it'll just give us a value between 1 to 6. Well, if we wanted to roll 2 dice and take the sum of them, well, we can go 1 to 6 plus 1 to 6. So now we can go anywhere between 2 and 12. Because 1 plus 1 is 2, and 6 plus 6 is 12. So this is just basically a pick random between 2 and 12. So it gives you the effect of rolling two dice. So we can go eight, four, six, eight, you know, and so on, so on, so on. But pretty cool with the, what you can do with pick random. There's a lot of very practical applications you can do with that. I want to talk about these angular operators for a second. Really, these angular values is what they are. Categories operators. And also in text-based programming, this is block-based programming, right? But in text-based programming, uh, operators are are usually there's usually about seven operators 
consistently in almost every programming language, which is the plus sign, minus sign, asterisk sign, which is this little multiplication symbol uh, called an asterisk, and the forward slash. But then there's also the greater than, less than, and equal to uh, symbol. So those seven symbols are really what are called operators in text-based programming. But in block-based programming, really all of these values here are operators. So just, just a little thing there. And so if we... Uh, we need to really talk about the um, the control category, which we're referring to as conditions, but uh, we need to talk about the control category before we can apply any of these. So we're going to skip over them for now and come back to them once we get to the control category. And there's also one down here, and we're going to skip that until we come down to the control category again. But there's still a few more we can work with. We have join a letter and length. We also have mod round and this weird drop down parameter one. But I'll go over these three on the left here first. So if we want to uh, go ahead and join values together, this is what we do. Let me explain. So if you have a word here, and by the way, in programming, anything that is more than one character. So, like, a character would be A, or just, or, you know, one, or something like that. Just a single, a single letter or number or symbol as a character. Anything more than that is what's called a string. So, this would be joining strings together, and it would be, um, so let's say we want to do hello. And then a world, and this other parameter should say hello world. Oops. Uh, yeah, let's execute our function. The reason why there's no space here is because we haven't added one. If I add a space after hello or a space before world, then it'll say hello world. Now, if we go ahead and this gets very interesting once we can plug in values. So if we go hello world, and we can actually join within joins. So we can have as many of these as we want stacked on top of each other. So let's say hello space world. My or actually, let's get another join. So I'll show you what you can kind of do with this. I am facing in the direction of I'm going to do a space before or actually, I'll just show you what happens if I don't. Hello world, I'm facing in the direction of 90. Let's, but there's no space between of and direction. There's no space between world and I. I usually do it at the end of each value. I usually add my space at the end of each value. Just so that I can go ahead and know if there's a space or not more easy. I can just see if there's a little bit of a gap here, but it's up to you. Hello world, I'm facing in the direction of 90. And just for fun, let's do one more. guess would be like this space and I can't add a space after this so I'll just go space before here and my size is and then I'll just plug in size here This is a pretty complex function. It's actually gotten bigger in height because it has to actually extend this out. Hello world, I'm facing in the direction of 90. My size is 100. I guess I need to put a space here between size and is. Okay, so that's really cool. What we can do with that. And there are all sorts of applications here. But this basically so you can mix uh, all types of data types together to create a string. Again, a string is just a combination of characters and and integer is just a number and a character is a single character. So this is combining strings and integers to create a really big string. In this case is all we're doing here. So, and it's really easy to overcomplicate strings, integers, and characters, but I'm just trying to explain this in the simplest way possible. And also that is pretty much it for our join, our join function. But we can actually do more here. We can go ahead and you're gonna, there's actually very similar functions to this in pretty much every text-based language. And basically what it is, is it'll take a number or it'll use a number to determine which letter 
to take out of a string. So for example, letter one of apple would be A, so it'll say A. Now letter two of apple is what P, since this is the second letter, so it should say P. If we set this to two. And we're just changing our first parameter to determine the number, and our second parameter would be the text we're trying to get the letter of. So if we want letter three of bird, it should be R because R is the third letter in bird. If we do something that's, you know, let's say five because there's four letters here and there's five, so this wouldn't really work. We're just going to get no value because it just doesn't work. And if I click on the operator, it's just giving me something blank because this can't really exist since bird is not five letters long. But if we go four, it'll give me D because D is the fourth letter. So does that make sense? And length of just determines the length, the numeric length of a string. So apple is five characters long, or I guess five letters long. So it would print five. Now bird is four. So we should get four once we run it with the length of four, or sorry, the length of bird should be four because bird's four letters long. The length of A. And I don't know how long this is, but we're about to find out. And so now I know that there's 79 A's within this string here. So there's just all sorts of cool little things you can do with that. And you're gonna find some really practical applications here soon. And just to clear things up, I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of these. So we went over join letter and length. I still haven't gone over the angular values, but don't worry, I have not forgotten. And mod and round are almost never gonna use these. And because this is a, you you are very likely never going to use these. Basically what round does is it rounds the numbers. So let's say you have a really long decimal. It'll just round it to zero. Or one in this case because 0.5 rounds up to one. Or it'll, it'll basically just round it and get a much simpler number out of the number. It'll give a less accurate number. It'll give a much simpler number out of whatever integer you choose to put in here. And I can't insert text. I can only, well, I mean, E will work since E can be used in mathematical context. But it really only lets me enter numbers because that is... Uh, it's looking for integer values, which again, integers are numbers. So, that is round for you. And mod is a very, so mod is a mathematical thing, and if you want, you can look it up. But it's not something I'm going to cover in this course, because it's something that is not very common in block-based programming, or something that you might find yourself using it in, uh, in text-based programming a little bit. But it is something that would take a enough time to explain that it would deviate from the scope of this course this is probably the only thing i'm not the only block or value or function or whatever i'm not going to really explain much you can actually go ahead and go to the scratch wiki for a explanation of it but again it's at a mathematical level that is a little bit beyond the scope of this course and this function i'm going to talk about but i'm not going to explain all of these because again some of these are for some really complex mathematical functions but basically you have a drop down parameter and then a manual parameter and what it does Again, it's looking for an integer value here for your text-based parameters or your manual parameter. And then for your drop-down, it's looking for a mathematical function. So abs or abs, for example, means absolute. Now, absolute value just basically takes, uh, removes the negative sign from a number if there is one. So the absolute value of 5 would just be 5 because there's no negative. But if we're negative 5, or let's say negative 4, it would still be 4 because it just drops a negative sign if applicable. And that's... A, not, I mean, there's more absolute values than that, but it's just basically, um, it's just a very broad explanation, just so you can kind of get, yeah, I'm not going to go over floor and ceiling, square root, or SQRT is a very common abbreviation for square root, and basically, I'll take the square root, so you can go 4, and the square root of 4 is 2, because 2 times 2 is 4, and, or I guess 2 squared is 4, so therefore, square root of 4 is 2. Uh, if you haven't gotten into that in your math class, if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, don't worry because you're not going to be using this in this course and likely outside of it. You're probably not going to be using it. And sine, cosine, and tangent is what these stand for. And a sine, a cosine, and a tangent are for pre-calculus and trigonometry related things. So that is not something you're going to be using very much. It has to do with like triangle, uh, triangles, like angles and sides and things like that. Don't worry about that. There's also lane and logarithm. Um, not going to be using that too much at all. 
well, actually, I say not too much. You're going to be using that at all in this course, and I've never seen people really using these in Scratch or really in block-based programming in general, even for really complicated programs. And then E, and, well, also this caret just means squared. So E to the power of, and then whatever number you have after it, or 10 to the power of, and then whatever number you have after it. So let's say 10 to the power of 1 would just be 10. But 10 to the power of 2 would be like 100. Yeah, because it's just 2 to the power, or sorry. Yeah, 10 squared, or 10 cubed, which would be 10 to the power of 3, or 10 to the power of 4. And if this doesn't make sense, it's okay. If you haven't gotten it to, into it in like a math class or something, don't worry about it. Because we're not going to be using this. And it's something that I really don't see anyone using. But it's just there as an option if you want to do some really complex math mathematical functions. And even whenever we're making our calculator, our calculator we're not going to mess with most of that. Now, we talked about events. We talked about when green flags, like things like that. You're going to use that a lot. We're going to talk about messages. We're going to use messages a, a lot. Control. So controls is going to piece a lot of things together here. So stay with me, please. So we have wait one second or however many seconds. Repeat it forever. I just want to talk about actually before I even talk about repeat it forever, I want to talk about wait. So wait just stalls for I'm gonna stop all scripts, stop them from saying that. Wait, it just pauses for the amount of seconds desired. Just looking for an integer value there. So if we go ahead and say uh, yeah, we'll do say. No no, a better way to do this would be Move 10 steps and turn 15 degrees, but it waits a second between moving 10 steps and turning 15 degrees. Let's run this script. Notice how it waited a second, and that is pretty cool. So I'm just going to go ahead and set this back to 90, and I'm going to set this back to 0. Those are the two values I was messing with there. So. That is what weight does, and you're going to use that a lot, so even if that didn't fully make sense, we're going to be using it so much that you'll be a pro at it in no time, and, uh, yeah, so, let's see, how do I want to structure this? Yeah, so, I talked about conditional statements, these are not conditional statements, right here. Now, these are, and I'll get to that in a moment, but these are controls, not conditions so i know it says events operators and conditions but these are more controls not conditions so yes the category is accurate but as as i'll get to these four are conditionals and not controls but you really don't need to know the difference but it's still good to know what conditionals and conditional statements are so i will define it whenever the time comes repeat repeats the desired number of times so if i want to repeat move 10 steps 10 times it'll just move me 100 steps because i moved 10 steps 10 times I want to do it five times, it'll move me 50 steps. It'll just repeat moves 10 steps five times. So it should move me 50 pixels, so our x value is at 100. It should put me at 150, just like that. I'm just going to go ahead and go minus 150 and just repeat it once, just to go back to where we were. And, yes, yeah, so you can repeat once. You can't repeat zero times, though. Well, actually, you might be able to. just won't do anything, right? Yeah, just won't do anything, because you're not repeating it at all forever indefinitely repeat something so it's like repeat infinitely is all it is so just think of instead of a number here within repeat it's just infinite and notice how you can't uh notice how with repeat you can actually place a block under here but it's closed off with forever since once you're indefinitely doing it uh there's nothing that can happen afterwards because just repeating and repeating and repeating so we can just forever go 10 steps I'm just gonna forever and i mean it, it kind of hit a maximum value there but it'll just forever go 10 steps and even once it can't anymore the script will still keep running until we actually stop it by either clicking on it again or using our stop sign here I'm just gonna go back to x0 all right let's talk about if and if else and before we even get into wait until and repeat until i just want to talk about these if you notice these slots actually these angle uh these angular values actually fit inside these slots but we'll get to that later so if we uh, go ahead and look at these, these are conditional statements. These are the exact definition, like perfect example of a conditional statement that people are always talking about in any programming course. So basically what if does is if a certain, um, if a condition is true, then something will happen. And whatever you want to happen, if it's true, will happen in here. And otherwise it'll just continue afterwards here. So like, let's say, uh, if something is true, then it'll move 10 steps. Otherwise, it'll move minus 10 steps. 
I actually have a fun way to demonstrate this. I'm going to go to my backdrop. I don't need castle and blue sky anymore, so I'll just delete those. I'm going to put a line about halfway down the middle. And I want my line to be, yeah, I want it to be black. And that width is fine. That's not halfway. It doesn't have to be perfect, but that was like not close. Because I'm not great with art. <laughs> Alright, uh, so we'll do green and red. I guess I'll have to convert the bitmap so I can fill that easier. Oh, because uh, there's a little piece of... The reason why that didn't work is because there's a little piece of uh, black here that wasn't fully touching. So I tried to fill the whole area. I'll just fix that real quick. Just like that. Okay, perfect. Should work now. Alright, uh, we'll go... Actually, do that on the other side. Alright, so we have green on this side, and then we'll do red on the other side. I'll do a toned down version, so it's not like super hard on the eyes. So, we'll just say... Um, I'm going to use blue, and then we're going to use pixel. I'm not going to use blue. I'll do... Yeah, I'll just go black. True. And false. So, I actually talked about strings, integers, and I also talked about um, characters. But there's also something called booleans, which is true or false. And I'll explain more, uh, I'll explain more about booleans later, but a boolean is a value that is either true or false. And so it's just basically a one or a zero, like a binary value. So it can only be one or the other, and there's no other possible value. Basically what you're doing with if, it's kind of a similar logic to boolean logic. Um, this is part of computer logic is what we'd call this. And if something is true, then something will happen. And if not, then something else will happen. I'm going to explain the difference between if and if else. We're just talking about if for right now. Now, if we move, or actually, I didn't mean to do that. So if, oh, oops. I'm just going to undo this with these. I actually clicked around the wrong functions here. So if it's, if something's true, we'll just have the cat go to, x 100 y 0 and if false it'll go to x negative 100 the reason why I'm doing this is you'll see I'll show you um so we'll just go uh, look at these I'm gonna talk about so there's actually seven angular values here we'll talk about all of them I'm just gonna go over these three first so we'll just talk about the equal one so if one equals one which it does and that's true then it'll the cat will go to the oops. The cat will go to the section of the screen. Oops. Okay, there we go. If uh if one equals one, the cat will go to the section of the screen that is labeled true. And if one equals zero, which it doesn't, then this happens. So if it's false, I'll just put them back. Okay. And I'm going to get this so I can just set them back easily. I'm going to just have a function here that I can execute. And so we know if 1 equals 1, we'll get to the true part of the screen. If 1 equals 0, we'll get to the false part of the screen. Well, what if... Uh, let's actually take this and replace it for 50. They'll also demonstrate less than. So if 60 is less than 50, which is not, then it'll be false. If 60 is greater than 50... Uh, well, it is, so it's true, so it'll go to x100, y0. Uh, if 50 is greater than 60, which it's not, then this won't happen. But if 50 is less than 60, which it is, then this will happen. I'm just trying to explain if logic uh, uh, in the best way I can. So, basically, if a certain condition is true, then something will happen. So, that's all it is. And... These are just greater than, less than, equal to. So if you have uh, for these operators that are uh, angular values, so let's say that this is 2 as greater than 1, then it would be true. 
if one is greater than two, which is not, it'll be false. And so it's just giving us the Boolean for it, whether it's true or false. Um, it's basically just outputting that so that we know right off the bat whether it is or not. Because, for example, I might not know whether this number is bigger than this number right off the bat. But this will tell me it's false because, uh, well, actually, this number has more places, so therefore it's bigger. But, um, of course, this could also be negative, and then this would be bigger since so it's positive, so it's true. But you can just kind of mess around with this, and it's we're just dealing with Boolean values here. And so basically all this does is based on the condition presented to the if clause, or conditional statement. So we can call it a conditional statement, we can call it a clause, or we can call it a control. But the most accurate way to refer to it would be a conditional statement or clause. So it would be an if clause or if conditional statement, but if clause is easier, so whenever talking like programming slang, it's kind of the terminology that they use, uh, this would just be a clause. So the value that is passed to the clause, if it's true, then what is within the clause will be executed. And if it's false, then, well, nothing really happens because it's not matching the conditions. So if 1 equals 5, which is not, it's false, so nothing's happening. It's not moving to x, 100, y, 0. Now if 5 is equal to 5, which it is, then he will whenever we execute this because this value is now true. Here's true. So since it's true, then this will happen. And boom, there is. So this is simultaneously explaining if clause logic and Boolean logic, which are very important for programming. Now, what make this might make this very clear to you is if we do if then and else. So what's the difference between if and if else? Well, the difference is instead of just having something that checks if it's true, there's also an option for if it's not true. So if five equals five then it'll go to a x, or actually I'll move him back to the center with this, but if 5 equals 5, which it's true, it does, then we'll go to uh, x100 or y0 or whatever else we want it to do, or otherwise, it'll go to x negative 100, y0. So there's a guaranteed outcome if this is false. So whether it's true, whether this value is true or false, something is going to happen. So if 4 equals 1, well, we know that 4 equals 1 is false, but it won't go to x100, y0, but else. So otherwise, if it's not, if this is false, then it'll, there's a alternative outcome, which is good to x negative 100, y0. So it'll trigger that else or that alternative outcome since this value is false. That is pretty much how it works. And again, greater than just means bigger than, and less than means less than, so, or smaller than. So 50 is bigger than 40, so that would be true. And 3 is smaller than 4, so that'd be true. But 4 is not smaller than 3, because 1, 2, 3, 4, and we're counting, so that'd be false. And 40 is not greater than 50, because 40 comes before 50, not the other way around. So therefore, that'd be false, and that's pretty much how those three angular values work. Now, we wouldn't actually call those angular values in text-based programming, but that's what we would call them in block-based programming. Now, there's and or not. I want to uh, explain these. So there's actually parameters available within these that are not manual input, like these where we can just enter an integer value. These are actually to where you have to enter an angular value. Or an angular value. So if x, um, let's say... If 60 is greater than 50 and 1 equals 1, or I guess 2 equals 2 works as well, I just mistyped, uh, then something will happen. So in this case, we'll go to x100, y0, because this is true. And we can actually check, boom, true. Just like that. Now, if one of these is off, so let's say 1 equals 2, which it doesn't, which now it makes the whole thing false, then, well, it's false. So it's, it's checking for both. Now we can do or. So if one of these is true, then it, the whole thing is true because 60 is greater than 50. Now one is not uh, equal to two, so this would be false. But since one of these is true, 60 greater than 50, then the whole thing is true. So therefore it's true. Now if it's not, not is basically, um, not basically like if it's not true. I mean, it's a very intuitive explanation, but... 
I, I think that it's intuitive enough in itself once you understand and and or. There's not really a better way to explain it because uh, if not one e so one equals one, right? And that's true. So if not one equals one, then it'd be false because basically it takes the opposite value. So if you pass in a true, it'll give you a false. If you pass in a false, it'll give you a true. If one equals two, which it doesn't, this is false. If one does not equal two is what this is saying that it's true, which it is true that one does not equal two, then that'd be true. And thus the whole thing is true. So if, if one equals one, or if one doesn't equal one, which is false, then it's going to be false. And if one does equal one, or sorry, if one does not equal two, which it doesn't, then this whole thing is true. And since it's true, it'll give us the return, uh, the result we want to give us whenever it's true. So, so that's and or not. We'll work with those extensively. So don't worry if that doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now, because I know this is a lot coming at you all at once. I, I do know that. So. Uh, this is dealing with strings again. It's dealing with strings. Uh, this is a string input on the left parameter and a um, or on the first parameter and a character input on the other parameter, the second parameter. So if apple contains a, then this is true because apple the string apple contains the character a. So boom, true. <coughs> if apple contains b and you don't use b to spell apple, so it's false. And if, uh, let's see, if 10 contains 1, contains the number 1, it's true. Contains the number 2, which it doesn't, then it's false, and so on. Again, string is the first parameter value, and or the first data type for the first parameter, and character is the second data type for the second parameter. So you'll get more practice with that, don't worry. So we talked about if and if else, let's talk about wait until and repeat until, and these will make a lot more sense now that you understand if and if else, or at least understand the concept behind it. So basically, uh, to demonstrate wait until, I think I'm going to use, um, hmm, I think I'm going to use a repeat conditional, or I guess it's not conditional, I guess a controlled, I guess I'm going to use a repeat clause. All of these are clauses, um, so some of these are uh, well, actually, no. Wait one seconds is a function. These two are functions, and stop, uh, stop at the drop down parameter is also a function. Everything else is either a control or a conditional, but both controls and conditionals are clauses. So repeat forever if if else. Wait until repeat until are all clauses, but repeat and forever are controls, and if if else or wait until repeat until are all conditionals. Then they actually separate it. So there's a little gap between the controls and conditionals, but all six are clauses. You don't really have to know that, but that could help you later in your programming career if you do understand that, just kind of the, the, kind of the rough terminology there. So we'll just go ahead and um, what should we do? I'll use messages as well to explain this because we do need more practices with that. I'll go a new message. I'll name the message. Actually, we'll just key it message one because it's the default one. We don't have to create one if we use it, since there's nothing that's already programmed for it. So, whenever we start the program, so whenever we click the green flag, um, message one will be broadcasted. Actually, I'm gonna get rid of repeat until and just clear this up a little bit. So, within this class, uh, we have two scripts here. So, this first one, whenever green flag is clicked, and I'm actually just gonna change the background because we don't need this anymore. Gonna make my eraser really big so I, just so I can easily get rid of all this. Okay, so maybe this is just stuff on my monitor because I'm seeing black specs there. <laughs> I guess it is. All right, so there you go. Let's go back to our sprites code, our sprites class, I guess, and give these two scripts here. So. One broadcast a messages as soon as the program is started. I'm actually gonna put them back in the center of the screen. So one broadcasts a message as soon as the program starts, and whenever that message is received, something uh it waits on something to be true 
to do anything below it. So let me explain. Whenever this message is broadcasted, it's being received here. But until something is true, and we haven't decided what value we want to be here, but until some angular value returns a true, or a boolean that is true, then the color effect is changed by 25. And I'll actually set the color effect to zero every time we start the program, just so, uh, just so it resets each time. Now, what we want is, let's just say equals, equal to. So whenever size is equal to, let's say, I'll use the size value. Whenever size is equal to 200, then this will happen. Now, let's just repeat. Change size by 10, and we'll do a weight half a second function. Again, we can do decimals, so 500 milliseconds or half a second. Uh, is what we would do so we could uh, so basically what this does whenever we start the program uh, the color effect is set to zero so it's just reset so nothing will change there because it's already it's already at zero zero is the default right? remember the looks and sound lecture the previous lecture so message one is basically uh, the message that we're sending to this other script so this script is normally deactivated but as soon as we broadcast message one the script turns on and what, as soon as, like, the, the script just waits and stops until this value is true. And the value is false because the size is 100 at the moment. But we can always change the size within our program, right? So we want, as soon as this becomes true, then this will happen. And it's not going to happen right away because it's just waiting on this. So what we can do is we can repeat changing the size by 10, 10 times. So that will increase it by 100 once this repeat clause is done. Uh, with 0.5 seconds interval in between, so the whole thing should take about 5 seconds. By the end of those 5 seconds, the size should be exactly 200, in which it'll finally change the color effect. Let's test it out. So it's changing the size here. After about 5 seconds, it should be at 200. Notice how this value is changing. And boom. As soon as it hit 200, it got past here. So it actually changed the color effect. And it'll go back to orange every time we restart the program, uh, just because... Uh, zero is the default value. Notice how it didn't work that time because we never set it to 100 and it's looking for a value of 200 before you can change the color effect. So if we go set size to 100%, whenever we start the program, we're not going to have that problem. Just like this. So every time you start it, it'll set it back to 100 and, and then go. So now this program is completely repeatable as many times as we want. Very cool. So that is basically what wait until does and repeat until is the same thing as wait until except there's actions that happen in the meantime. For example, instead of waiting until, we can repeat until. So maybe we want him to move a pixel with no interval in between or no delay um, until size equals 200. So we start at size 100 and he's just going to keep moving and moving and moving. As soon as he gets to size 200, that won't happen anymore and his color will change. And that's just a rough example of what you can do with repeat until. Same as wait until except for an action keeps happening in the meantime. And we could also do a wait 0.5, for 0.5 seconds here as well. Just so he doesn't move so far. And uh, let's actually set his X and Y to 0. Every time we start the program, just so he starts in the same place, at the same size, at the same color. So this is completely repeatable. Now he's moving such a small amount, it's kind of hard to see, so I'll do move 10 steps just to visualize it a little bit better. So you can see he's kind of getting bigger as he moves to the right. And then once the size finally equals 200, as we can see here, the color effect will change. I just want to make sure you guys really understand that, so that's why I'm repeating myself a lot. And there we go. Let's talk about stop. So stop is a drop down parameter. We can do stop this script, other scripts, or all. So what stop this script does is let's say we want to move a thousand steps but we can't do it because after the script is stopped nothing we can't add this on so if we put this in between i guess it won't let us do that since it detects that we're trying to do something it doesn't like but if we can't add this onto the bottom because the script is already done as soon as it reaches this point 
We can stop other scripts in script and sprite and then still move a thousand steps. But now all these other scripts, so any other scripts within the sprite are all dead, except for the one that is currently in. And then we can also stop the sprite that's currently running at the moment. So let me actually demonstrate this. Because I know that wasn't the best explanation. And you kind of have to demonstrate an explanation. So I'm just going to reset the size and position real quick of our cat. And what we can do is we can do uh, stop other scripts and sprites. Let's say, and we can have as many of these as we want, right? As many of these one green flag click. So one of these will um, forever change color by one. And one of these will wait five seconds and then stop all the other scripts in the sprite. Did not mean to do that yet. So after five seconds, everything else will stop, and then we'll have another one that sets size to zero. Or changes size by one. And uh, we'll have another one that sets size to zero, sets color to zero, and all that good stuff because we don't we want it to be repeatable. Just like that. So color effect and size is set to the default value, and then it'll slowly change until after five seconds, all of these scripts are completely dead. So for five seconds, it's growing and changing color. But after five seconds, it'll all come to a halt, even though these were forevers. So even though it definitely does this, this stop will override it. And we can also do a stop all, which not only stops all of the other scripts, but it stops all the other sprites and all the scripts running in those sprites. All the other classes, if there's any scripts running in the backdrops, or, or sorry, in the stage. All of these scripts in the entire project will come to a complete stop. And it basically is the exact equivalent of pressing this little stop sign right here. So stop all stops everything. Now if we stop this script, the other scripts will keep running, but this script will be gone. So these will just keep running indefinitely, these other scripts. And all this script did was just wait, so it'll just stop. And then these are just going to keep running and keep running and keep running. And yeah. So you just have to know when to use the three parameters of stop. We're going to use all three quite a bit. And last three functions we're going to go over. And this lecture are the clones. I know this was a really packed lecture, but you kind of have to explain these all at the same time so that you don't get too lost. And it'll save you time in the future, I promise. So there's something called clones. We can start as a clone, create clones, and delete clones. And start as a clone just is basically what happens whenever... Uh, here, actually, I'll show you. So let's say when the flag is clicked, we'll just wait a second and create a clone. And create a clone of myself and if there's other sprites then those will show up here as well but myself just refers to the current sprite that's selected which is sprite one so we'll create a clone of sprite one just like that so now we have two of these and clones actually reset every time you stop a project so it doesn't create a new sprite it just creates kind of a copy of that sprite now when i start as a clone we can go go to X random Y random. We'll just go to a random position somewhere within a 100 by 100 pixel uh, box. So I'll actually create 10 clones. So if I do this, I'll wait a second and create 10 clones. They'll just kind of go to random place. Actually, let's go. Just to randomize this even more. We'll do a 200 by 200 area. Oops, let's, let's just start the whole thing. Because again, it'll delete all the existing clones every time you stop a project. So I was just creating all these clones. So we can have all these clones do even more. We can make them all forever change size. Or, yeah, we'll just do that. Just like that. So now it's creating a bunch of clones that are just indefinitely changing size until they hit their max. Or we can maybe have them change size like 15 times. And then just delete themselves. It's going to go 15 times with maybe like 0.1 seconds in between. So it'll take about 1.5 seconds total for this whole thing to go through. Or for this whole function to complete. Or this whole clause to complete really. And then the clone will be deleted a second afterwards.
just like that. And we can even go uh, something like this. Say self destructing. And then after those two seconds, it'll immediately delete itself, just like this. So now these clones are going to say self destructing. And then two seconds later, they're just going to all get deleted. Very cool. And now we only have our cats as all the clones are gone. So you can just do a whole lot of really cool things with clones. Wasn't a very practical application, maybe just a little fun one there. You can do some really cool things with the animations as well with clones. But we're going to go into some really advanced things with clones later. This is just kind of a... Um, this is kind of an overview. Kind of a broad example. So... Going to get rid of these. Um, I just clear it up. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next lecture, lecture number 11, sensing and operators, or sorry, sensing and variables. Um, I know this was a really long one, and I know that there was a lot of stuff we went over, and it does, it's, it's totally okay if not all this made sense, these will all be reinforced concepts, and we're going to be using these over and over, I just want to give you guys a understanding, a broad understanding of what they are, so that you won't be lost in a rework on projects. So. Uh, we'll do sensing and variables, and we'll deal with my blocks and comments. We're going to reinforce the data types we talked about. I know I kind of brought that up out of nowhere, like, you know, booleans, integers, characters, and strings. But you're going to want to know those, and again, I'm just going to do a quick review of that. String is a bunch of characters combined. A character is just an individual character. Boolean is either true or false. It's literally just the word true or false. And, um, and then integer is just a number. It can be negative, it can be a decimal, it can be positive, it can be whatever. It's just integer is a number. So that's it. Um, I'll see you guys in the next lecture, lecture number 10. I'm just going to go back to my stuff here, and uh, we'll do that. And I look forward to working with you guys on sensing and variables in the next lecture.